Welcome everyone uh, to this, our first meeting in the Cubic Theatre here at Covent Garden uh, since February 2020. Um, I should explain that uh, to those of you who may be watching this uh, a little later on YouTube, uh, that the event is being recorded in early October 2021 uh, in front of an invited audience. Uh, the audience is made up of those who've supported the Friends during the various lockdowns, uh, from the speakers who gave the recorded talks on YouTube uh, to members of the Friends management team and the trustees uh, who enabled the Friends to continue to deliver uh, the membership benefits to individual Friends uh, throughout lockdown. Uh, so thank you to everybody for whatever they've done, uh, those who recorded talks, those who kept the activities going, uh, and those who worked at home to keep all the admin uh, up to speed as well. We're using this event as a thank you for all those people's efforts, uh, but also to test out for the first time uh, for those 18 months uh, live meetings here, make certain all the technology works and so on, uh, and assuming it does, which so far it seems that it is, uh, we should be putting this meeting uh, as a recording on YouTube, uh, and we will return to live meetings here as a matter of course uh, in a few weeks' time, uh, but those meetings will also be available on YouTube so that everybody can watch them. I guess probably there's nobody in the transport world uh, who fits the bill of needing no introduction uh, than Sir Peter Hendy, who is our speaker tonight. Uh, I will say, though I probably don't need to, a former Transport Commissioner of Transport for London, currently Chairman of Network Rail, a member of the Museum Trustee Board, and above all else, a member of the London Transport Museum Friends. So thank you, Sir Peter, for agreeing to kick off our new programme of talks. Uh, without any further ado from me, over to you. Brilliant. I think Sam and the management team of the museum have just done the most remarkable job. Um, and um, we've had our moments as trustees with, um, with, uh, with, with some management issues in the long period when I've been a trustee. But I have to say that the uh, effort and, which has been put in and the ingenuity which has been shown by the museum's, um, uh, the museum staff, particularly since there was all furlough and you know, less people uh, to do the job, I think has been absolutely fantastic. And I think, I think without doubt it will come out of the pandemic a bit different but stronger and I think that's due to Sam's leadership and all the people in the museum. Um, so uh, it is great to be here, uh, actually. Um, it's nice to be anywhere, actually. Um, but it's also very exhausting. Um, I don't know whether any, any of you have found this, but I find meeting a lot of people after 18 months really exhausting. I sort of I go home and sort of can't do much else because the, the Zoom and Teams have no emotion attached to them. You switch on, you do all the business, then you switch off again. Um, and uh, I've, done, I've done some speeches now, and I'm just sort of, you know, I'd, I'd, I have the same level of apprehension sometimes before I start, but I have a gr much greater level of exhaustion when I've finished. Um, and uh, this, this is no exception, partially because I was going to talk to you about the work that I've been doing for the government, in fact, for the Prime Minister, uh, about the uh, Union Collectivity Review. Um, and uh, I, I, I would have come with a lot of slides... Um, many of them are in uh, this, which is, where's the front of it? The front of it's here somewhere. I had the front of it this morning anyway, because I, oh, here it is. Here's the front of it. And indeed, this is the rest of the text. But I can't talk to you about it, uh, because there's no date for publication. And um, uh, sadly, on, uh, even, it, even though it's my independent review for the Prime Minister, it's not the done thing to talk to a big audience about what you've done before it gets... Uh, it gets released. So that's hampered me a bit because actually that would have been full of interesting slides and diagrams. Um, but you're not going to hear anything about that this evening um, because it's, it, I've finished it, but they haven't, uh, they haven't got a date for, um, uh, for publication. Um, so we'll save that up. Uh, I will tell you, I am actually also tired because um, I'm Saturday afternoon it transpired that there was a public event in Manchester uh, this morning, uh, which was uh, the Prime Minister and the Chancellor came to visit the works for 
the Transpennine route upgrade in Queens Road, Manchester, uh, and they only decided to do it on Saturday afternoon. So, um, so I went to Manchester last night. So I, I had to get up early, and I've uh, actually there's there's quite a good picture of me in the Times or the back of my head anyway. Um, so it's the obligatory um, uh, um, picture in orange and hard hats of important politicians, sort of making things level up. Actually, in this case, uh, which would be on the well, probably on the telly at lunchtime. So I'm a bit bit more ragged, but that was a good opportunity. Uh, because you don't often get a bit of time with the Chancellor and Prime Minister, and I was able to say to Boris, I've finished this bloody report. <laughs> Can you get it published, please? <laughs> I'd like to get on with the rest of my, uh, the rest of, rest of my life. Um, so one day I will talk to you all about that, and it's a shame because the other piece of work which you'll know about is the, uh, his, his idea about a fixed link between Scotland and Northern Ireland. And there's a really good report about that, which hasn't been written by me. It's been written by Doug Okervy, who many of you will know, at least know of, if not know, and Gordon Masterson. It's absolutely really fascinating um, uh, exposition of uh, the issues surrounding building a fixed link between Scotland and Northern Ireland. Uh, and I would have loved to have told you all about it because it's a really interesting story, but I can't. Um, the interesting thing about that, of course, is you'll have read a bit about that story in the papers, um, uh, and it's been in there several times about what my conclusion or what their conclusions might be, which I might endorse and how much it might cost and whether it's going ahead. The really interesting thing is that nobody has been in touch with either the two of them or me about any of it. So I'm reading all this stuff and thinking, actually, you know, if somebody had been bright, they might have rung you. I might have said no comment, but you'd have thought, well, actually, somebody might have asked you. But that tells you a lot about modern journalism, that you can write all those stories and not ask the person who's been asked to do the work. Um, so I could tell you how much it's going to cost, and the, and the likely cost of such a thing um, it has not been in the public domain, and all the numbers that have been used have been stunningly inaccurate. But then nobody asked, so they wouldn't know, would they? So uh, it only proves to you that you should watch what you read in the, um, uh, in the, in the papers, really. Um, so uh, apart from the uh, apart from going to Manchester for um, uh, about fifty minutes this morning, coming back, um, so I had to talk about something else. So there are no slides because because um, uh, I had to talk about something else. But I do have something interesting to talk about, uh, and some of you will have seen this, which is the government's uh, rail reform white paper. And I thought I might instead talk to you a bit about that because I've been quite involved in it. Um, and uh, keep you right up to date. I'm really pleased to discover that this is going to be recorded before it goes out, um, because the more interesting I make it, the more likely it is I'll want to alter the recording. Um, <laughs> and and, and I'm not, I can't say anything to you about the fixed link or the UCR, because that will get me into trouble. But if I inadvertently tell you things about rail reform, then I can, I'm very happy with this audience this evening, because you're all wonderful people and I trust you all. But... If I take a bit out of the recording, uh, um, uh, it will be because I got enthusiastic and told you what I thought and not what I should have said. <laughs> um, but uh, it, is an it is an interesting subject. And the last thing I'll say in the introduction is, uh, I mean, I've, 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 I've found myself unexpectedly working really hard during lockdown. I, I, I actually thought it might all get easier, and it has got easier because Andrew Haynes, who's the chief executive of Network Rail, which is what I'm paid to do. Uh, I'm sure some of you know Andrew. He is a fantastic guy. Um, he's brighter than me. He's certainly younger. He's got a bigger brain than I have. He probably doesn't drink as much. Um, and Andrew has transformed uh, my life in Network Rail and Network Rail too. And Andrew is a great force for the good. So I have actually been progressively inching towards persuading Sue that I'm not really full-time. Uh, and that was the position before lockdown started. But actually, during lockdown, I acquired all sorts of jobs. The Secretary of State asked me to assure the uh, recovery from COVID out of several lockdowns, both for actually not only the railway, but for public transport in the UK in general. Uh, and then, as you probably read, I nearly got called the Christmas travel SAR, which I got relieved of because Boris cancelled Christmas, um, <laughs> uh, which was... Probably, um, probably beneficial, really, at least my reputation. Um, and uh, I had a couple of rather odd, odd uh, appearances at the um, press conferences about COVID, where I was brought on as a sort of uh, silent extra, virtually. Um, 
and we've done a lot of work on, on GBR, and I've also done that union stuff, so it actually hasn't been, uh, it, there hasn't been much rest, and in the middle of it I took on the chair of the Euston Partnership, which is rebuilding Euston with HS2 and the network rail station and everything, which has proved to be a bigger job than I imagined it was. So, But anyway, that's all beside the point. So I'm going to talk to you about rail reform. Uh, and I thought I would start with a bit of history, uh, set out in my normal prejudicial way. If I look back on my time at TfL and my career at London Transport, I think we're, despite the ups and downs, and poor old Andy Byford is in the middle of at least a financial down at the moment, I think we're very lucky that nobody seriously questioned the, the, the existence of the entity. About when Boris was first elected mayor in 2008 and nine, one or two of the rather ho more hopeless assembly members used to sort of say to me, oh, well, you know, why is it all together? Why don't we split it up into bits? But they didn't really mean it because it wouldn't, splitting up TfL into its constituent parts would have fragmented a system that everybody recognises works together and, and is part, part of the city as a whole. And nobody, I think, has ever really, uh, uh, you know, seriously suggested that in history? Can you think of anybody, Sam? I don't think so. Certainly, certainly not in the modern era. But of course, the railway was privatised in 1994, and um, the major government decided to do what Mrs. Thatcher decided that was too difficult, and they did it by chopping uh, the, the entity into a million pieces, um, and. Uh, created uh, a whole series of many, many, many interfaces. Um, Peter Parker said something like the railway will, f you know, falls on its knees at the interfaces, badly uh, quoted. Um, but it also did some good. It actually released a lot of people in train operations from from the shackles of uncertain finance and uh, and, and and you know the lowest common denominator and. It would be hard not to say that actually what's happened in the train operating company world until comparatively recently has been has 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 been aided by that by that process. Um, and you'll know that that actually Nick Newton, who was an actor at, uh, at, at London Transport, who was actually at the Fifty Five Society last last Friday, was instrumental in setting up the early passenger uh, franchise contracts which were pretty simple documents. Actually, I remember at Centre West, newly privatised, I sent off for them all to see what they looked like. And actually, I didn't fancy running a railway, but actually they, look, they were documents that at least you could pick up and read in uh, without lifting both hands. Um, but that uh, OPRAV um, uh, morphed into the Strategic Rail Authority, which was the right sort of thing to contemplate the future of the railway. But unfortunately... Um, I won't say anything about, about Richard Bowker because he's a decent bloke, but what is undoubtedly true is that he fell out in magnificent style with the government and their remedy to falling out with him wasn't to get rid of him but to abolish the institution. And what happened then is it was taken into the civil service and, and, and the department got its clutches on railway franchising and the operation of the railway uh, and, and it's been in the department's hands ever since. Um, the, the infrastructure, of course, famously was privatised in one go as rail track. Um, they, I think they thought they were all sorts of things. I think they thought they were a property company for a bit. They didn't like engineers much. And, of course, it ended in financial and, and tragic disaster in, in, with Hatfield in 2001. And then it was reborn as Network Rail, which was... Because uh, and, and, I turned up at that party too late. I always seem to turn up in places after the cocktail cupboard that's been slammed shut and the uh, chauffeur-driven cars have been sold off. But Network Rail was an extraordinary uh, uh, co concept because it was a public company, but with no shareholders, because nobody would invest after rail track, with, with members who had no, so far as I could see, and I was one for a bit, there was no, you had no real sway over the, the management, but it was a public, it, it was a, a, a PLC um, with no shareholders. And it had the ability to borrow unlimited funds backed by the government, but not on the government's balance sheet. Uh, it was a remarkable constitution, and it worked for them, because when I turned up, and I think it's still true by and large, because we haven't got rid of much of the debt, uh, we had the same 
level of debt as, the, as New Zealand. Um, they'd run up 50-odd billion of debt in order to buy and do things to the railway, which they did, you know, to, to, to be fair to them in, in some good degree. But, of course, that, that, that party couldn't withstand any decent scrutiny by anybody dealing with public accounts, and it duly didn't. And in the autumn of 2014, it was effectively nationalised. So then you got actually what was uh, what, what the the the, the, uh, the train company franchises were let by a government department, and Network Rail fell back into the uh, into the Secretary of State's hands. So it had the Secretary of State was the sole shareholder, um, and of course the other problem with that was it moved overnight from having the capacity to borrow unlimited quantities of money to one where the Treasury said amidst people saying it will make no difference being owned by the government, the Treasury said, well, here's a fixed borrowing limit. And, and, and at that point, the uh, ambitious enhancement programme for what was Control Period 5, 2014 to 2019, was, uh, uh, could, could not be sustained. One of my first jobs when I turned up in July 2015 was to write a report about the enhancement programme. And, of course, quite a lot of it couldn't be done because there was a fixed Treasury uh, uh, limit to the amount of grant uh, and um, if you ever read that report I mean I said that it couldn't all be done that was my language the, the choice of what was done was then a government choice because they're in charge and it's their money um, but it was a really unsatisfactory situation and I, I, I think the organisation you know I, I, I place a lot of store in what Andrew's done as a chief executive but it was it was shocked by being taken into public ownership it had a lot of its um, uh, toes stamped on by a government that didn't want to see any waste and didn't like spending any money, which are not the same things. Um, and um, it became an instrument of government and it got left with ambitious programmes that couldn't be fulfilled uh, and a very largely centralised structure that worked rather well when there was a lot of money flowing about but didn't work very well when there wasn't. And then, and then the final indignity of what there were many actually, and, and the Great Western Electrification was one, um, which was everybody's fault, and we can get onto that if you want to ask me. But the final indignity, of course, was the May 2018 timetable change, which was a, a disaster in Northern England because we, Network Rail, failed to deliver an infrastructure enhancement which would have allowed electrification, and it was our fault, and I had to apologise. And those of you who've been in senior management positions in public transport, you should be ready to apologise and you should look ashamed at doing it, but it was pretty hard because it was just our fault. We'd promised to do something and we just didn't do it. So that was a disaster there and also Thameslink, which was not really our disaster, but was a disaster with all the best intentions born of a train operator who promised to do a new timetable but then didn't find the staff and the trains in the right places to do it. Uh, and and, and they, were, they were both disasters. They were disasters of great magnitude. Uh, and, the, and, and the real thing about them, which is probably beneficial, somebody writing the history in 15 or 20 years' time is going to spot that. This was the first time that a Secretary of State had worked out that when the stuff really does hit the fan, there is only one person responsible in that structure, as it was contrived then, and that was him. And Chris Grayling found that he was, in fact, in charge of the railway. It was his fault. It was our fault that we'd done something wrong, but it didn't come together until it was his fault. And, and that was, uh, you know, you might, have, you might all have sat at home before then and thought, well, this, is, this structure so, so severely doesn't work that in the end the Secretary of State's going to fight. And we didn't contrive it deliberately, but the truth is that in the railway as it, as it was constructed in 2018, and by and large still is, when something bad goes wrong, it is the Secretary of State's fault because it's an interlinked system. The trains run on track and, and it's very complex and they're all interlinked and different trains you know, run on the same bit of track. So, and, and Grayling, um, Grayling didn't get a good press as the Secretary of State for transport, but I think the best decision he made was that you shouldn't put up with that. And it was a really good decision to say, I can't bear this, because he, he got widely blamed for it. Uh, so he said, well, what, what shall I do? And uh, he commissioned, and I think it was right to do it, he commissioned a, uh, a, a comprehensive review of how the railway works. And uh, we were very supportive, 
rather in mute because if you've caused part of the difficulty it's quite hard to stand up and say yeah it's great to revise it because you're still looking humble from having frankly loused it up um, but he did commission a full review and, and, and there's lots of people who go around saying oh the railways had many reviews and I've done two of them and most people who've got anything to do with the railway has run, read, written at least one in their time but actually the, the, the review that Keith Williams was commissioned to do is I think the first review since privatisation of, of the comprehensive structure and, and the purpose of the railway. So a word about the appointment of Keith Williams, uh, which is that um, some of you will have met him because Keith, uh, well, Keith's quite, quite well known. He, he was the chief executive of British Airways. Um, uh, he's, uh, um, but more significantly, he was on the TfL board for eight years. He was one of the few sensible people who Boris sent me to help run TfL when he became the mayor. And Keith's a fabulous bloke. He's sensible, he listens, he's a good private sector, competent, top-level manager. Uh, he's, he's, he's just got common sense everywhere. And he, and he was a really good appointment to do that review. And I'd like to think I had something to do with it, but I certainly didn't have everything to do with it. But Keith was commissioned to review... Re re review uh, the railway um, and he started work and he started work as you generally try to do with these reviews and now I'm near the end of another one by listening to what people said and he's a very good listener Keith because he's he nods and encourages and looks like he's listening but in fact he doesn't tell you what he's thinking as a consequence of what you told him and he went around the country listening to people talking to him and, and it's, a, it's an admirable trait, you know, to listen to people and not necessarily to respond to it. And he did it for months and months. And he was well on the way to finishing his works, work when Boris became the Prime Minister in July 2019. And he appointed Grant Shapps as the, as the, um, as the Transport Secretary. Which I, I think was also a turning point. Because actually, um, as you will have worked out, whether you like it or not... The, the current Prime Minister is not particularly dogmatic about anything much. He's not dogmatic about the private sector. The, the stock response to the latest horror of some privatised train company used to be that they've got great faith in the private sector, even if they didn't do the job properly. Um, but actually this government is not dogmatic about it, certainly not in transport anyway, and he's a lot more interested in good outcomes. Uh, and, and Grant has, has, has taken that, that mantra too. Um, and uh, the way that Keith was going, I think, suited that sort of less less dogmatic. Let's not worry about about the, the necessarily the politics with a big P about what you're going to recommend, but actually, actually, you know, what are the answers? What are what are the outcomes that matter? And then by early 2020, Keith had finished his work very largely. He probably largely thinks thought he was in the same position as I am with this thing, which is let's just get it out. But of course then suddenly COVID happened and COVID changed things on the railway in 48 hours because if you've taken revenue risk uh, and there are no passengers, you've got no revenue. So overnight, um, the, uh, the franchise uh, uh, contracts had to be cancelled and replaced by cost contracts, um, uh, which is inevitable, which was inevitable um, on the, in the process um, one or two of the of the train companies for different reasons has already moved into the public sector. You will have noticed back then that there was no great pressure from the government to say, oh, we're going to move LNER or Northern back. Uh, they weren't too troubled. Um, but, of course, significantly, at the point at which the contracts were changed and they were cost contracts, it was a very different story. The government was now taking all the revenue risk um, and um, and and in a way, the the uh, the road ahead for what Keith recommended had been made a lot easier because the government was in e even greater control of the railway than it was before. Um, we haven't had at all a bad pa pandemic. I mean, uh, we Andrew and I and many others in the railway have to go and account for people who still worry about what's going on. But I think at the moment we've had something like thirteen billion pounds worth of support. Um, it's been absolutely amazing. People in the airline industry, people in the coach industry, some people in the bus industry have been on their knees in this pandemic because they haven't had enough money. The railways kept running. It's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. There hasn't been a single member of the railway staff put on furlough. 
Isn't that incredible? It, 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 it's completely remarkable, from which you conclude that actually at least this present government thinks the railway is something worth having, uh, even when the community is in, in, a, in a really, really difficult uh, state. Um, I wouldn't say that everybody in government was keen on, on taking over the revenue risk. I think there are still many people in the Treasury who rather like uh, having the revenue as an incentive to do a good job. Um, but as I say, it, it had rather done a bit of Keith's work for him. Um, the Rail Review was on hold. It was on hold, frankly, because everybody had better things to do uh, in terms of trying to make the country run. Uh, politicians and Andrew and I and everybody else on the railway um, included. So uh, it was rather left in a corner for, for many, many months, um, which is the right thing to do if you're in a in, in the grip of the, uh, the biggest national crisis since the war. Um, but in the, uh, in, in the back end of last year and over Christmas and early this year, um, it, questions began to be asked about what had happened with this. It became clear that a plan was needed to move the railway forward as the pandemic moved into different phases. It's really hard now to predict that the pandemic is ever going to come to an end. But clearly, we're in a different phase. We've been through some different phases in 2021. Um, significantly, the Secretary of State added his name to the uh, to the uh, report. Um, somebody with more ego than Keith might have been quite upset by that, but we all thought it was brilliant because if the bloke's prepared to sign up for that, he might actually be prepared to take on board the changes that needed to be made in order to institute it. Um, and we were we were all very pleased with it. Um, there was a lot of discussion within government, uh, uh, with Treasury, with the department, about whether or not what Keith recommended was the right thing to do. I think that's fair. I think the other thing, which is quite obvious, is that nobody else had any idea what else to do instead. The franchise system is broken. It is quite, you, you would not be able to put it back together. Nobody but a lunatic would take a risk on railway revenue for the foreseeable future. So it's created the opportunity to do something different with British, with Britain's railways. Um, Keith's white paper went through many, many drafts. Some of them referred much more, much more, uh, f in a much more friendly manner to uh, Andrew and indeed myself and Network Rail. That they, they, we were in and out uh, quite regularly. Uh, we, we were out in the last edition that got published. Um, and I, I don't wholly blame people for that either. Network Rail is not a name like Transport for London. Uh, I hope all of you, and certainly I would die for Transport for London, it's the right institution to do the job that it does. I don't think Network Rail really is, and I don't think Andrew thinks so either. We just happen to be in charge of something that, that is a creature of the history of the, of the, of the railway. Uh, and we certainly would not want, I would want the culture that Andrew's instilled in Network Rail since he's been there in 2018 to be better replicated in the new circumstance. But we're the last people to say that Network Rail is perfect. It was very centralised. It had a culture that just said no. Don't, don't worry about the bloody customers. You say it's no to me quite regularly and to him. Um, and it was very centralised and very arthritic, and we don't want that replicated in the new structure. So I don't mind that it's not particularly uh, generous to, to Network Rail. Um, but if you wonder why we think we can talk about it, the answer is because we're probably the only big beast left in this forest. We might be limping along a bit, and we might not be athletic as a, as a gazelle, but, but we're there. And actually, in the circumstances in which we are in with GBR, it would be sensible to use the good bits of network rail as a basis because you haven't got any other foundations to build your house on. So whilst we didn't appear very favourably in the final version, we are there and, we're, and, and we're, we're part of the solution. But Andrew and I are always very keen to emphasise, including to audiences like this, that we don't want network rail's old culture replicated. We, we are very happy to be part of the solution and we're very happy for the good bits of network rail to be part of the solution, and I've had to say that to very senior people in government, including the Prime Minister and the Chancellor. Um, it was a struggle to get this thing published, um, and uh, by dint sheer, I think, you know, there's so much of uh, history which is a bit of an accident. Uh, we, Keith and I were asked to brief 
Prime Minister before we had a meeting with the Chancellor and the Secretary of State about publishing this report. And um, we did brief him, actually. I know, I know a bit about how to brief Boris, and the best time to brief him is immediately before the meeting that he's addressing, which is the subject of the briefing. And we were lucky to get in. But what was even more extraordinary was that he said, oh, well, you might as well stay for the meeting. Now, actually, I'd put a tie on because I thought it might be in 10 Downing Street, and it wasn't, and Keith and I were there virtually. But we were able to witness the Prime Minister and the Chancellor and the Secretary of State actually deciding to publish the report, which is something to talk about, really. Uh, and uh, it, was, it, was, it was very interesting, not because I'm going to tell you that anybody was in wild opposition, but what I will tell you is that Boris actually does uh, think that he knows something on this subject and he's used his experiences with me and Mike at TfL and he was emphatic that he thought somebody needed to be in charge of the place. And I'm very proud that actually Mike and I all look older and tireder and drink much more as a consequence of working with him, but actually bloody well learnt that somebody ought to be in charge of a big institution. And, and he was very emphatic about it, and, I, and I'm very pleased about that, because that is Keith's recommendation. So it was agreed to publish it, um, and, um, and, and you, can, you can see the result, which is this. Um, I had something to do with the cut front picture. I won't claim much, uh, much to do with the contents because it's Keith's report. But I am very pleased that the double arrow got on it as well as the Union Jack. And that is the only picture we could find of a station with both of them. Uh, and, it, and the sun's shining and it's got some passengers as a bonus. But it would have got on there even if it had been <laughs> raining with no passengers because it's what it needed to show. Um, and uh, as I was just explaining, Network Rail is being used to some degree as the corporate basis for change because there is no other way of making the change. You need something to build the foundations of this house on and, and we're, we're going to do it. And if you've seen, uh, actually I'll read you a bit from a release today because Grant spoke to the Conservative Party conference today, but, but I'm very pleased about that, not because, as I've said, we're not going to replicate the NR corporate culture, but actually trying to build this from scratch will be really quite difficult and you might as well build it on on some foundations you've 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 already got so Keith's recommendation is to separate um, the the politicians a bit to find somebody who uh, to find to create a body that's fully accountable uh, and distinctive from government simple sustainable and separate uh, uh, the name of Great British Railways is fine I, what's what's in the name um, it's you know, it will be it will be British and it will be the railways and hopefully it will be great. So I don't, no, nobody could mind that. But more, much more importantly, with a customer focus, with collaboration and customer service, run as a network. It says it says the railways too fragmented, too complicated, and too expensive. And it's not hard to agree with all of that. But it's music to a lot of people's ears to find the railway referred to as a network because that's what it is, and that's why people don't like some of its characteristics. Because in the, in the worst features of some of the train companies, they think you're their passenger. But you're only their passenger if you get on and off at the same company station. And if you're not, as people used to find at Euston, if you, if you want to go somewhere that's only on northern trains, the people from Virgin Trains used to say, well, nothing to do with me, wherever you're going. You know, Raven Glass, there might be a train at the other end, might not. But, and, and people hate that. They just hate it. They, they really hate it. And I hate it too. And I think finding that, finding that the government is prepared to say that it should work as a network. Um, and more importantly, using the current period of nobody w willing to take the revenue risk is really useful because using that to make a thorough reform of information and fares and ticketing and to reduce costs and to do a plan for the future, which I'll talk about in a bit, uh, and work out what, what the new contracts for private sector train operating companies should, should, uh, should, should, should look like um, is all a good thing and it might also open up the market because whilst you weren't watching a lot of people didn't go decide they didn't want to take on train franchises because they were too risky which left the market pretty, pretty devoid of, of players and there, there are some people out there who want to do it but not on the basis it was offered and, and I find it really hard not to say that's really profoundly sensible 
to take this time when the government has to take responsible responsibility for the revenue to fix some of the things that really have need to do, needed to be fixed but haven't been fixed in the last 25 years. And, and I think I, I won't go on unduly about reducing costs because that's clearly quite a difficult issue. And one of the results of, uh, of privatisation has been to create a market for labour, which by and large, certainly as train drivers go, has pushed the rates up enormously um, but I think what's more important is the information fares and ticketing well everybody hates it you know I come from TfL where people liked us people trust TfL you're willing to give TfL your credit card details and it will take the money off your card and if you watch people going through the gates they're not bothered what it says because they think TfL is honest and straight and will nobody would do that with a train company you know my brother's a rampant socialist so I said well you buy your train tickets he said well Train line. I don't trust any of those train companies. I said, well, but they're private sector as well. Oh, are they? You know, it, it, it's hopeless. It's so diffuse and disorganised. So, and, and to get a hold of that and to change all that into the 21st century is just a, 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 a great thing to do. Um, and, and, of course, there's a lot more in here, but, but you, you get the flavour of it. And Keith has, he's absolutely nailed it. I think all that listening and all that, quiet analysis of what people told him, both customers and operators and so on, is all as a result of this. I've got, I've got a real, uh, you know, I think he's a, a really bright guy and he's done us a huge favour on the, on the, on the railway. Um, so what's happened since? Uh, well, actually one of the significant things is that, uh, is that Grant Chaps is back as the Secretary of State for Transport. And uh, I think, frankly, as the railway, we couldn't ask for anything better. He's put his name to the report. He wanted to publish it. It's now published, and he's there till uh, he's there till the next election. So now it's got to be delivered. That's great. It's his report. Let's do it. You know. So that's what Andrew and I are, are saying to him. Um, and indeed, today there was an announcement uh, which I will pull out because I was reading it. Um, here we are, the Transport Secretary has today also announced that the forerunner of Great British Railways, the Great British Railways transition team, is beginning the work of transforming the fragmented rail system into a streamlined sector focusing on delivering for the passenger. The transition team, headed by respected industry leader Andrew Haynes, will be responsible for driving forward the planned reforms over the, years, over the year ahead. And then it says all the stuff about customers and trained in a culture, not just a bigger version of NR. Growing the network, more people travelling, making it easy to use, doing things quicker, driving down costs, having a can-do culture, harnessing the best of the private sector and getting to, to, to net zero. And, and actually, we're really pleased with that, and I'm, I'm especially pleased that Andrew has been mentioned personally, because he is a respected leader, and, and I think he's very well suited to it. Not, he's not presuming he'll be in charge when it happens, uh, and, and I'm certainly not presuming because I'm much older and a lot more stupid that I'm, I'm there. But actually, the, the Secretary of State making this announcement saying there's a transition team is, 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 is a great thing. Um, it's a very complex journey that we've got to go on because the, the, the train companies are now in a different place and there's all sorts of interim contracts to be issued and other things are, are, getting in, uh, are happening too, like the business about the South Eastern a few, a few, a few days uh, 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 ago. Um, the RDG you'll have worked out, which is partially, or was, is currently partially a industry trade group and partially is responsible for a great swathe of common things that serve the railway, um, has to be, uh, has to be re rejigged. Um, and more to the point, primary legislation has got to be drafted to actually make the railway uh, make GBR a, a new corporate body um, and in fact you can't set up uh, uh, you can't even start to really set up a shadow body until that legislation's got all, a long way through Parliament. So as a matter of fact the, the GBR transition team is is run by Andrew being paid as Network Rail. Uh, I'm, I'm just forming a board subcommittee to oversee it but it probably wouldn't surprise you to know that that board subcommittee will be chaired by Keith Williams, not by me, which I'm really happy with, uh, because I, we don't want anybody to think that Network Rail's old ways will get into the new way. But there's a huge amount of stuff to do, uh, and 
Uh, actually, the transition team's been working away over the summer, and quite a lot of of of, of work it, it, it has been done. Um, and we've also got ourselves into a new circumstance. So, like everyone else in the world, post the pandemic, things are different, um, and the railway's customers are not going to return in the way that they were before the pandemic. Um, but I'll tell you one of the good things. One of the good things is I get every week the revenue on the railway. I've run Network Rail. I'm not run it, that's pompous. I've been the chair of Network Rail for six and a half years and only in the last four months have I ever known what the passenger revenue is. How can you run anything with cost to no income? You know, so forget all the track access charges because that's all you know, accounting mumbo jumbo. So we now see the income and we're seeing it daily and we're seeing it grow weekly and it's dead helpful and you'd be surprised how useful that is in running the railway infrastructure if you know where the customers are, you know? It's just helpful. And 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 in fact this this the last one I saw we're back to sixty seven percent, which is better than many people thought thought we might be. Um uh, and of course it's distributed unequally because when I was in Cornwall in August, I, actually, I didn't go on the St Ives branch line partially because I couldn't get on a train because it looked like the Northern Line in the rush hour. They were absolutely packed. Some of the Great Western branches have had higher passenger numbers this summer than they ever had before COVID, and leisure traffic is extraordinary, as I can testify when I was at Euston waiting for the train to Manchester last night. And of course, commuting is not what 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 it what it was, and it may not be ever again. And our job is to adapt the railway to what patterns people what people will, will show. But I'm not sure myself that we yet know what they are because I think when people say to me, what are you going to do to get passengers back? Actually, with commuting, it's not what the passengers want to do at all. It's what the employers tell them to do. You go to work because the employer says, if you don't, they won't pay you. You know, it's a pretty simple deal, isn't it? Actually, even I'm like that. And, and I think we haven't yet seen a lot of employers, including actually Network Rail, have not quite decided how many people they want in for, for what time every week. Um, so we, we haven't seen the end of that journey. But what we do know is that as we adapt to the new structure and the new ways of doing, uh, uh, and, and, and you know, a new railway structure, we've also got to make the railway adapt to what the passengers want, want from it. And we are trying very hard to do that. And I read a very encouraging paper this morning about a whole range of initiatives to get passengers back where we think they've got the opportunity to make a choice about coming back. And actually, I don't think that would have been done so comprehensively before. But what I do know is I'd never have seen it. Because what would have happened quite late on is somebody had said, well, you've got to change a timetable. In some, you know, it takes years to change a timetable. And, and actually, we're, we're, we're already working together in a in a better way than, than we were. So that's very encouraging. And actually, I spent most of the summer with Tony Poulter, who some of you might know as a non-executive director of the DFT, and we've been, su we've been supervising, I don't know what the right word is, we've certainly been acting as sponsors for the work stream about information and ticketing and fares, because we know that we know a revolution is needed. It actually has to be a revolution. And of course, I've got some... History. I don't claim to have done it at TfL, but I was there whilst it was being done on my watch. And I know what it looks like. And what it looks like is people having the confidence to put their card on a gate and for the, whoever's taking the money to take the money out of it and for you to travel seamlessly. And actually, that's what it should look like because that's what it looks like in every other retail transaction I do. You know, there's no... Even taxi drivers take cards now. You know, how, how, how 21st century is that? In fact, the only place where people still queue up to speak to somebody is at a station because nobody trusts the system. And I don't trust it either. You know, I'm sure I've said this to you, some of you before in other circumstances. You know, my kids, when they come down to Cornwall for our week every year, if I've got time, I'll spend a couple of hours on the internet, see how cheap I can get them there. I can always get them there cheaper the longer I work at it, even if it buys eight tickets and they have to change it extra in Plymouth. You know, it's nonsense, isn't it? How can you possibly present that as 21st century travel? And, and, and we're going to crack it, and Keith knows that too, because uh, he travelled around the system and he knows all about split ticketing and, uh, and, and all of that. So, so we, are, we are starting to, to make some progress, I think, and it's going to be hard and it won't, you know, now... 
I know what the next thing is. There'll be a message from Grant in the morning saying, well, when's all this going to happen then? Because I've announced it. And of course, it's not quite as simple as that. Um, I thought I'd finish with one thing that I think is a direct comparison with TfL. Because one of the things that ha has been a real problem for Network Rail, and for me, in fact, I mean, when I, was, when I turned up in 2015, I was asked to review the enhancement program by Patrick McLaughlin, who's in the, the Secretary of State. It was an astonishingly ragged document. It was a huge list of things that Network Rail thought it might spend money on. I couldn't actually work out what some of them were. The, the descriptions of them were partially about improvements to train services, and then they were engineering things. And there were things in that list... I mean, when I went, went round ask, you know, asking people what was important, um, I found things that nobody could describe properly. It wasn't clear what they were, and it certainly wasn't clear that I had any supporters. The electric spine. Remember the electric spine? I couldn't find anybody who was in favour of it. It was only electrification from, um, from uh, uh, the, the, the bits which were missing from Southampton to Sheffield, but nobody wanted it. That's really interesting, isn't it? How does something like that get on a list? And the answer, of course, is because the, is because the way in which that, the railway is, is currently and has been run for a long time, there's been no prioritisation process and no long-term plan. Uh, and, 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 and if you look at TfL, if you look at the... You know, Sam, Sam, when he's got some time, will knock, knock this book out about the first 20 years of TfL... But one of the strengths of, of, of the whole structure is that you get the mayor, this is all in the GLA Act, and the, and the mayor has to write a London plan, which is a long-term spatial and economic development plan for the, for, the, for the city, and then he has to have a transport strategy, which describes in transport terms how you, how you deliver it, and then TfL has a business plan, and then it has a budget. But the advantage of that is you always know what the next good things to do are. And you must have heard this story, because you certainly aren't the first audience I've told this to. So one evening, I was walking back to a flat in Pimlico, and you know, unknown number on the phone, and it's Boris. He's wobbling back on his bike after a good dinner. And he said, Peter, he said, how about, how about building a second cable car? And he, oh, shit, here we go. <laughs> so I, in, in a, in a mo rare moment of clarity, I said, yeah, how about not doing it? How, how about doing the next thing in the transport strategy? Oh, yeah, he said, what's that? I said, Crossrail 2. Well, we haven't got quite as far with that as we thought, but I sold it to him because I knew what the next good thing to do was. And I can't tell you that on the railway. What's, what, what, the ne what the list of things that we're currently investing to do are, I mean, is, is a mixture of what was on Patrick's blotter, what was on Grayling's blotter, what various people think they ought to do, what we think we ought to do. It, it's a mess. It is a mess because... This is a national system of profound importance to the economic and, and social well-being of the country, and we can't tell you what the next best thing to invest your money is. And that must be wrong. So part of what we've got as, as part of GBR, we got, we've got the Secretary of State to sign up to writing a whole industry strategic plan. And, and that's a really good thing to do. And it won't be right the first time round, but then if you, some of you will remember, the transport strategy wasn't right the first time round. You have to go through a big process of getting people to buy in and finding out what they'd really like. Uh, but the second time round, it'll be pretty good. And the point we're trying to make to him, uh, I think Boris is sold on it actually, is that that isn't a static document. The, you know, the TfL plan was and still is reviewed quite regularly. Circumstances change, politics changes, Something sometimes politicians need something at the top which is different from what they needed last year. That's fine, there's nothing wrong with that, you just alter the, alter the ranking in this plan. But not to know what to do on the railway next is a really bad place to be. And I'm hoping that we can solve it, I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased that that's got in, uh, and um, I think actually the... Um, uh, the, the devolved administrations have already managed to do better. Actually, it's interesting. The Scots have got an in electrification programme because they do know what they'd like to do next. And, I, and we don't. And I think it's a massive uh, weakness. And ho hopefully the whole industry strategic plan will address it. And I'm sure you'd be pleased to know that um, by some, uh, by not entirely a fluke, uh, the person who's leading the work on it is Elaine Seagriff, who used to work for us at TfL because she knows what she's doing with uh, long-term strategic plans 
Uh, and even if it isn't right in the first iteration, it will be a great thing to reference to work out what's right for the um, for the for the railway uh, in 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 the future. Um, and that and that's I think that's as applicable in the circumstances in which government is much bigger and has has more more tentacles to re reach around. I don't think anybody, and certainly not Andrew and I, believe that somehow GBR is going to go back to the British Railways board days when the stock answer to any parliamentary question was, this is an operational matter for the British Railways board. Life is not like that anymore. I've spent enough of my life working directly for politicians to know that if they want you to do something, you better find a way of doing it. I don't think that's any, anything wrong with that. But what I do think is that having having a, a measure of a measure of a gap between the uh, between the the delivery organization the politicians is good it involves somebody being in charge of it and getting blamed when the things aren't right and I think that's absolutely correct um, but it, 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 it it's 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 bound it's just bound to be to be better and we are going to have to work in a world where government has spending reviews and your plans might be upset by how much public money is available. Uh, and it might vary, and it doesn't look unduly generous in the medium-term future because of the uh, pressures put on us by COVID, and that's going to be quite hard because there are going to have to be some things done to reduce the cost of the railway, particularly if not all the passengers come come back. Um, so the legit, so so there's quite a big team of people working away uh, on the GBR transition team. Uh, the legislation is beginning to be drafted. Uh, and it needs to get in Parliament next year in order to be out by the uh, by whenever the election might be. Um, meanwhile, the spending review, which is very close up, will have a lot to say because it, it's three years, including the first year of uh, control period seven, which is um, oh god, it's, uh, it's five as it's twenty four to twenty nine, so it'll be the first year of, the, of that. So we've got to make our case for the. Uh, uh, for enough money to operate and maintain and, and up, upgrade the railway in some pretty challenging circumstances. Uh, climate change, forget, forget decarbonisation, climate change is having the most profound effect on the railway infrastructure in a way that you know, wasn't really envisaged five years ago. Um, I think they're going to make an announcement about the integrated rail plan for the north. That's actually really why I went to Manchester today. Have five minutes whispering in Boris's ear, saying, "Get on with it, for God's sake," because uh, we do need to get on with it. Because these projects get more costly the longer you, you in gestation they are. Um, there's all the stuff about HS2 and where that goes, and I might even have something to say about where HS2 goes and its connectivity with certainly with Scotland and Wales in my in my own report. So it's not like there's nothing going on, but I, I mean, I hope that I well, firstly, I hope it's been interesting. Secondly, I hope that you take heart from what I'm saying, because actually Andrew and I, when we're, not, when we're not wringing our hands in anguish about how difficult civil service processes are, which is entirely understandable, part of this is lifting the franchising of the railway out of the civil service. That's not a simple thing to do, uh, and not everybody will enjoy it. So we do have our moments of, of, uh, of at least anguish about how hard it is and how long it's taking. But I hope you take heart, because I think that the secret of what Keith has recommended and what, what, what the Prime Minister and the Chancellor and the Secretary of State have accepted is treating the railway as a system and understanding that that's what the customers want too. And if we can get that in, and if we can deal with the customers you know, decently better, then actually we will have made a change. And whether, whether Andrew's still there when it happens, whether he's asked to be the Chief Executive or not, he doesn't know, and I don't know either. When I, whether I'm there, I'm even less certain, because I'll be 70 in two years' time, and there is a practical limit to how often you can, you, uh, to, to, to how, much, how much you can do. But I don't think that matters. I think what matters is that you turn this into something that looks naturally like the structure that ought to exist to give a decent train service, and then you make it work. And if we can do that, then we all have done something pretty damn good, I think. There you are. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter, very much. Let's see if we can remember how to do that. Um, we have got a roving mic, which Graham's going to hand around. So if there are any questions, it might just be a courtesy if you were to say who you are, if you have a question. 
Uh, there's Roger down here. Can you reach him? Great talk as always, Peter. You mentioned um, only lunatics would be run taking revenue risk. So what do you think about Luno and um, Hull Trains and Grand Central? What's their future in this great British Railway integrated network? Where, 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 where do easy access operators fit in? Um, well, it's a, it's a good question, isn't it? I, I, think, I think it's not unreasonable to suppose that even an authority which is charged with running the British railway system might not have spotted every nuance of the market. And I don't think, I don't think you should, you know, you can see conceptually how you can say, oh, well, you can either have one or, or the other. And I think, well, they're there. So um, why, why not see what happens, really? Why not see what they think commercially? I mean, I, I think the legislation... I suspect, strongly suspect, the legislation will be written to allow them to continue. But on the other hand, actually, uh, we're all taxpayers, or I hope you all are. I shouldn't have been allowed in if you're not a taxpayer. But, but, but you're paying for this railway, and finding people getting things at less than the cost of producing them, or, or actually sucking revenue out of companies that are otherwise subsidised by the taxpayer... It's quite a hard sell for the taxpayers, isn't it? I mean, really it is, you know? And, and I know some people who would lecture me endlessly about the, you know, about the marvellous market opportunities. So, and, and, it, and it remains to be seen whether their track access for those people is actually reasonable in the way that it's currently constructed or it isn't. Um, I mean, I have much... And, I, and I, somebody ought to pull me up on it. I should have mentioned freight. And I, 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 I have a lot of sympathy for the freight companies because they are truly trying to do something without, without state subsidy and they're not competing with an, another state company, uh, with, with one small exception. And, 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 and I think that they deserve a better ride than they've got. Uh, and I think it's important that they get one for all sorts of sustainability and other reasons. Um, but, but we'll see, you know. I mean, maybe, maybe there are markets that... that, that that are, you know, maybe there are segments of some of these markets which are better served by, by those people. It, but, but some of the what they're proposing does beg bigger questions. You'll have seen the controversy about the East Coast timetable. Well, part of the controversy is whether you should sacrifice more intermediate stops for faster end, end to end journey times between London and Edinburgh. Well, somebody has to make that decision. You can't just, well, I mean, actually, it has just evolved how it is, but it shouldn't be, should it? You should actually work out what the right, what, what you think the best thing is to do from time to time. And I'm not certain that this current, well, I'm, I'm pretty sure this current structure doesn't m make those choices either, either visible nor, nor transparent when they're made, you know? But good luck to them, actually. Uh, what what else can you can you can you say? And then of course there's a large part of the railway, which is just heavily subsidised, where nobody wants to do it, or they shouldn't be allowed to, because the object is to reduce the amount of subsidy. One of the interesting byproducts of us coming together and not being so parochial about uh, about what we're doing is that um, there is a part of the railway where actually we. Our people have got together with another state-owned train company, of which there are now several, and worked out what the total cost of the railway is in comparison to its income. And it's eye-watering, of course, because there's quite a lot of the British railway system like that. And the object there is not to promote competition, but to try and offer a decent public service at the lowest possible subsidy. So we'll see, won't we? I mean, you know, good luck to them. Why, why, why shouldn't you? you, you know, and, and, and actually, for that matter... I should perhaps have said, because it's important, that Keith is not set against people having some revenue incentive, and I think it's right to have some revenue incentive. The question is, if you reform the costs of the railway and you reform the way in which it's planned and you reform the fares and ticketing system, then you might well be uh, keen to offer some incentive to get passengers on the seats, because that's a good, good thing to do. And do you know what? Surprise, surprise, there's a bit of a revenue incentive in the overground contract. Nobody seems to remark on that much, but it's there. 
because I remember it was put there for a good reason, which is to incentivise the operator to want to get revenue, to collect it and be keen on more of it. John Carr, right at the back, sorry, up the stairs again. Thanks, Graham. Uh, so, Peter, that was, uh, as usual, a uh, presentation on which so many different questions could be uh, discussed. But at the moment, of course, the bus industry outside London is sweating uh, very hard to deliver bus service improvement plans under a national bus strategy. You've given us a flavour of what we might expect as uh, Grant Williams is, uh, or Shaps Williams rather, is um, implemented. But I think there's another dimension, isn't there? First of all, there's the question of integration between the modes. One could expect that the bus and other shared transport modes are going to be doing the last few miles of what is primarily a rail journey. And there's also the question of how much of a voice the English regions should have in shaping the services that they actually get. You said that this strategy is based a lot on listening. To what extent will the people that have been providing the information that's been listened to be able to comment as the implementation proceeds? So, I think the first of those, I mean, integration, actually, if you can get as far as, as waving your card at a gate and paying a fare that you trust, I think integration is quite much easier to achieve. And, and I, I mean, a lot of people, it, it, it's, a, it's a bit of a tough concept, actually, because what you need for real integration is a, both a healthy railway and a healthy bus service, actually, and for that matter, a healthy taxi industry. Um, and if, if, if it's healthy, then you'd like to think they might talk to each other, though I think some of the, you know, sort of let's have a system like Switzerland is a bit optimistic because the economy of Britain is certainly very changeable in different places. Um, but we can do a lot better by modernising the ticketing system and indeed if, if other urban areas turn out to be a bit more like London, it follows that I, I don't think it will be that difficult to extend pay-as-you-go ticketing to bus services in cities outside London. In fact, the, the more the bus industry is on its knees, the easier it will be. Most bus operators will go quite a long way for real money in their pockets these days and I think you could probably offer them some real money in their pockets. So I, I, don't, I don't think that's particularly difficult. Uh, the, the, the influence of regional authorities outside the cities is, is, is also a very apposite question. Um, you'll have spotted that the white paper doesn't say terribly much about it. Um, and I think one of the reasons for that, I have the, I have the uh, job of sitting on the Board of Transport for the North uh, as the Network Rail representative, so I better be a bit careful about it. Um, but one of the things that you do need uh, um, regional leaders to be able to do, well, you need two things. You need, to, the, you need them to be able to make some choices because you can't have everything. And you also need them to be willing to pay for some stuff. Um, and, and I think that's why London works well and that's why the Welsh and the Scottish governments work well. And, the, and, and, and when you praise the Scots for electrification, one of the reasons you should praise them is because they've chosen which ones to do. And I haven't said, I want everything now. And actually, um, probably as impolite as I'll get in Transport for the North, it sounds to me like sometimes they're all saying, we just want everything now. Everything's top priority. Well, it isn't top priority. We used to have all those arguments in TfL. The list of things in the business plan is, is, is a set of priorities and they have to be ranked in numerical order. Not everything is top priority, it can't be. And I, and I think at least what you're looking for is some maturity from regional leaders to understand that you might, you, you, you might have to aim at some things and the government is not, is not made, of, made of money. I mean, you know, when they do announce the integrated rail plan for the North, it will not all be delivered at once. It's probably a 25-year programme. Somebody's got to choose what the best thing is to do first. 
you know, and the, and the sad truth is if you look at the TfL investment plan, there are some things that never seem to get to the top. Well, that's because there isn't enough money for everything. So there does actually have to be a realisation about prioritisation, about limited resource and about what, what most needs to be done. The other thing is that there has to be a realisation about the boundaries. Now, I think one of the things that was very grown up about the overground was that we didn't insist on taking train paths, particularly on the southern, which obviated better services to places outside London. I think, I think when we did that, which is now quite a long time ago, no credit to me, but plenty to Howard Smith and to, to Ian Brown, because I think he was around, and, and John Fox we made a balance about what we asked for without disrupting people's travel outside the Greater London boundary. I think you have to be realistic like that. You, you, you have to recognise that although your voters stop at the, at the London boundary, the demand for travel doesn't, and I think you have to be really sensible about it. Um, and I'm not even sure wholly that some of the, de the two devolved administrations are quite as good at that as they might be. Wait for my report to be published and you'll see. But, but, but the interests of people in Wales and Scotland and England don't evaporate at an artificial boundary of any sort. And if you're going to allow some freedom to regional, uh, re re to regional leaders and authorities, then they've got to recognise the limitations of that because there aren't many train services which don't cross, you know, county or regional boundaries. And, and it is interesting that actually the English regions are not particularly well developed. I think, I think it's a huge credit to several governments that they've recognised the utility of metro mayors because the, the mayoralty in London has been successful. But even some of them are pretty, are, are, are pretty immature yet. And, and I don't think it would be... If you've just established that what, what, what the con consumers really want is a integrated network of railway, uh, 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 an integrated railway network, then it wouldn't be too clever to allow regional politicians to balkanise some of it, would it? I've been very careful to pose those as questions rather than statements. Because <laughs> it, 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 it won't be my choice in the end, I don't suppose, and it may not be anybody's choice. It may evolve through, through, through politics. But, you, you know, I, 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 I haven't yet seen much sign at Transport for the North, and I've been sitting on their board for six years, that anybody's gone into a back room and chosen which are the best things to do. They all want everything. And we did, we did do that in TfL. There were things in that plan that I can tell you will never be delivered. They're in, they're in the list, but they're a long way down. There isn't the money for them, and there never will be. And, you've, and you actually have to recognise that. And just don't say, oh, well, the government will pay for it, because the government won't, will it? Because it's our taxes again. Oliver. Oliver Green. Um, thank you, Peter, for that very interesting talk. I'm sure that one of the central things you talked about is absolutely right, which is the need to consider the rail services as a network and to get it properly integrated. But I also think that it's not, it's not just, as some people seem to think, it's not just about money. I mean, it, it does take a long time to do these things. And sometimes, even in the regions, it's, uh, it's worrying that it takes so bloody long to do anything. I mean, I experienced this just yesterday when I had to go to Birmingham by train cross-country service, which was a little bit of a disaster because it wasn't, it was only four cars, absolutely packed, leisure service, um, and in my experience, cross-country is always like that, and people need to know how they can change that and improve it, and at the moment, they're not, like most rail companies, they're not the most customer-friendly. Then when I got to Birmingham, um, I wanted to go to a part of Birmingham, and I thought, oh, I'll be able to use the new tramway and then discovered that they're already actually taking up part of the tramway, which has only been laid down about two years. And as soon as I got outside New Street, there is a, a ripped-up tram track. Uh, of course, I had to use another mode. I had to go by bus. And I'd forgotten that Birmingham doesn't actually have a bus station. And there's no indication when you get to New Street as to how you get to the main bus routes. It's actually only about a sort of five-minute walk. But unlike in London... 
there is no integration between modes. And, you know, the, the bus services in Birmingham are pretty well as chaotic as everywhere else in the regions. I mean, you always get that terrible shock when you go outside London, when you realise how poor bus services are nearly everywhere, even in urban centres. So I, th I think, you know, there are great things that can be done, but I just, I despair about how long it's taking the regions, even if they've got the money. I mean, Birmingham have taken about 15 years to get a piddly little tramway done. Um, and Edinburgh has been just as bad, even though they've, they've now got a very good system, but it still doesn't go where it's supposed to go. Um, it's, even if, if they've now got the regulation to do it under Great British Railways, I'm, I somehow worry about how long it's going to take, and they, they need to get it done. <laughs> well, um, I think there are three questions, and I'll answer them backwards. I mean, the, tr the truth of badly building tramways is that we have a problem, which is, uh, which is a national problem, which Andrew Brandt will lecture you about some other time, which is that if you only build one in a while, um, and every time the contractor loses money and goes, bu goes bust, then we never have any experience of doing it properly, and that's actually what's happened, I think. And I, d I didn't know that they'd already taken the track up in Birmingham, but you suspect it's because it hasn't been built properly, um, and they'll probably have to fix it, and that's certainly a, a big lesson in, in Ed Edinburgh. Um, so, I mean, as to, as to onward travel, I think it does vary where you are. I think if Laura Schaaf was here from uh, West Midlands Combined Authority, she might argue with you a bit about it being not quite clear. Birmingham but Birmingham's too big to have a bus station. It does need good information. And I'd be slightly surprised if you couldn't get it. Um, but, but yes, it, it should be better. And if it, if it is... Is it likely to be consistent everywhere in Britain? Well, it actually isn't, because if you if you go for local control, then you do allow local management, local politicians, to influence how the system's presented and what it looks like. I think that's one of been one of the failures of of integrated ticketing across Britain, which is that a lot of places have spent money, and in TFN's case, quite a lot of money, trying to reinvent an integrated ticketing system which works quite well in London and failing miserably, which is a real shame because actually, you know, why would you do it? Why would you buy it again? You, you copy what you've got. Um, but you, you, we're not in the position where where I, the government is interested in better local bus services run by local and regional um, people, including private companies. And the, and, the, and the first bit of the question, the railway is a big place. Everything in it takes a long time and costs a lot, and I've worked that out. But that was true in London as well. The trick was to have a plan. That was the trick. It wasn't that it was any easier to do the things that TfL does in railways and the overground, but the trick was to have a plan and a direction. And, you, you know, what's the origin of cross countries' inadequate rolling stock? It was a decision taken you know, some time passed by the government, uh, by the DFT in specifying the franchise and they probably didn't want to specify more rolling stock because they got it cheaper if they didn't. And the result is all the trains are too crowded. And it, it will take some time to fix that. The, 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 the British system, actually the British system is shortly going to be awash with electric rolling stock that, doesn't, that, that hasn't got anywhere to run and no passengers to sit in it. But it's always been terribly short of diesel rolling stock for some very obvious reasons, because the government haven't bought it in the franchise agreements. And some of that depends on money, and some of it depends on having a, a coherent long-term plan. I mean, I didn't even start on what you could do if you influence the rolling stock owners to redistribute the rolling stock in the best way for the passengers, rather than who bid for it first, you know? Uh, that, that, that would seem to be a pretty logical thing to do, wouldn't it, actually, if you were running an integrated system, and it's clearly not, not, not happened so far. Um, but, it, you, you know, to that end, there will always be things wrong with it, because actually, you know, one of the troubles with the railway is that all the investment lasts for much longer than modern lifestyles stand up. And I think it's just really difficult, isn't it? And, and, and if you're lucky... You know, the other thing is that it's cyclical. Sometimes there's more money and sometimes these franchises have been let with brand new rolling stock when maybe they didn't need to be and other times there's been no money. 
Well, it's true, isn't it? You know, actually, actually, those decisions matter for real people. But, but you, you, you know, I, I, all I can say is I think it will be better if somebody thinks about these things on a, on, a, on a network basis. It's less likely that you'll get, you know, hopeless inadequacy in some places mm -hmm. and a load of stuff parked up somewhere else uh, than, it is, than it is currently. And, and yes, it will take quite a long time to sort out, but then it always has. And, and, and you know, the, the, the railway is an incredible institution because, you, you know, the stuff that you build you know, the stuff that Brunel and Stevenson built is getting on for lasting 200 years. All these trains last 40 years. We're not living life in the, well, we're not living life in the same way as we were three years ago, are we? So all the bloody rolling stock's the same, isn't it? All the stations are the same. All the trade union agreements are the same. So it is quite hard to do that. Um, and it isn't like modern retail. But on the other hand, it, you know, if you go to bed, it, my glass is half full because actually there's a lot you can do with what you've got, particularly if you're defter at managing it. And the, and the other thing is that there's a great, you know, there's a great public sympathy for this institution. We are so lucky to have had government spending all this money on it during the pandemic. And we're also lucky, whatever you think about the trade unions, that virtually everybody who works the railway regards it as a vacation. You know, people are really committed to the outcome of what they think the railway is there for. And those are good things. And you wouldn't get them, you know, do you get them in banks these days? No, because it's not secure employment. So you have to make the best of the things that you've got. And will it be perfect? It won't. Can we manage it better in a better managerial circumstance? I think we can. Time for one last question. I think Richard's got his, oh, Richard's got his hand up. What chance do you think there is of getting significant further rail electrification? Uh, I think there's quite a good chance, actually. Um, the, you can see why the decarbonisation policy might be skewed currently in favour of road transport, because it has a lot further to go. Um, but you can also see the advantages of a continuous ele electrification programme. Um, and... Uh, I, I'm, I'm not, you know, one of the advantages of having a long-term strategic plan, actually, which I don't think they might have realised, but they'll see it when it's done, is that if you do a long-term plan, you can stretch out that the policy until the end of it. And if we carry on as we are, we're not going to meet their decarbonisation target, but we can't really prove it because nobody's interest, nobody's got a document that shows what the long-term looks like. And, and I think if we did get such a document, I can see now that there might be great pressure not to publish it because the end of it might look embarrassing, but then that's a good reason for doing something about it, isn't it? And, and we have been lousy at it in, in England, um, and, it, and, and we are, actually, Network Rail is getting better. Some of the Scottish experience and some of the lessons that have been learned as a result, result of the Great Western debacle um, have made it cheaper, but what the supply industry really needs and the railway needs is a continuous programme, isn't it? But I'm not sure that I blame the Secretary of State, because if you look at the, the transport firmament in terms of decarbonisation, you know, concentrating your effort, for example, on road, on, 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 on freight on roads is not a stupid thing to do, because it's got a bloody long way to go, hasn't it? You know, there isn't an assured solution for the methodology by which 95% of freight in Great Britain goes any distance. So we better fix that first. You know, I, I sort of understand that. And I, and I think if we do a decent whole industry strategic plan, I think some of the things that will fall out of that will be making some of that case in a way that's more persuasive than it has been in, in the past. You know, we're, we're rightly traduced for the Great Western because it was a terrible project badly done um, but 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 of course its origin was that was that nobody had done much electrification for a long time so all the expertise had to be reinvented that's the that's the tramway problem you know um, so I, I, I'd, I'd like to think we can get there you know m money allowing but go on. 
I saw Andrew's hand go up as well, so definitely the last question. First of all, to reflect back on all the wonderful stuff that Peter has said, I think the answer to your last question is that the previous electrification was East Coast Main Line, Mark 4BR, which was designed by the Treasury. And hence the problem, it blew down in a 10 mile an hour wind. Looking forward, Peter, you've rightly said that the um, faith that people have in TfL when they click their contactless cards or the Roysters on a machine, they've no idea what they're being charged and they don't care. Mm. Um, the difficulty we have outside London is that the primary choice for any kind of travel is the private car. It only needs one key. You don't need to go through a plethora of different train companies, bus companies, ferry companies, anything else. If I go tomorrow morning to the Netherlands, I can use this piece of card, the OFA chip cart, on bus, train, tram, ferry. It resulted in a huge explosion of public transport use there, to the point now where most mainline services in the Randstad region are every 10 minutes. Can you give me an idea when I might have that freedom to travel so simply in the UK, or maybe even at least in England? Will it be in your lifetime? Um... <laughs> Who knows? Who, who, who knows? I, I mean, all you can, you know, actually, actually, these, these thinking about these things is always a matter of reflection, isn't it? I mean, I, you know, I, on a good day, I think we are, the reason I chose to tell you about what's been going on is I'm, I'm quite hopeful that it will res result in something better. Will it be quick? No. Will it be cheap? No. Will it be perfect? Undoubtedly not. I mean, on the whole, I still wake up in the morning and think, what can you do today which will make things better than they were yesterday? And sometimes life intervenes to make it worse. I, 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 you know, the, the interesting thing about this government is that actually you wouldn't have necessarily thought that a Conservative government might have wanted to have a, an integrated railway system nor a national bus strategy. But, but actually... They have done those things. Are they easy to achieve? No. Are, are they guaranteed of success? Absolutely not. Is it the job of people who've got any influence to try and make them happen? I, I think it is. I mean, you know, I think the national bus strategy is a real step forward. Is it, you know, is it accompanied by enough money? Probably not. How much might it cost to do it properly? Who the bloody hell knows, you know? Uh, what do you need to do to equip local authorities to play a proper role in the operation of bus services outside London? Crikey, you know, that's a big question, isn't it? Um, but, but we ought to try and start the bits that we can and because I think they, they lead people to a, better, to a better place. And I think the interesting thing about railway travel is, you know, for all the faults of the current system, you, you know, as the pandemic has receded a bit and things have opened up, the railway's full of people doing leisure travel. That's great, isn't it? You might have thought that they would have got the habit of getting in the car and going, but they haven't. They're not, they weren't, certainly not on the 17-something to Manchester on Sunday evening, they weren't. And I don't know if you read, but there was some Great Western train that failed to stop at Swindon, and there was a revolt on Sunday evening, and they had to take it back to Swindon. Cause, yeah, but, you know, actually, people wanted wanted to be there. Is that enough of the percentage of population to make a real modal shift difference? Well, possibly not yet. But if we can get the railway in a position where it recognises those things and, and it can prove that it does some good things rather than just being on the front page of the papers for some bad things, I think there's a much greater chance of it in the future than there was in, 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 in the past, you know. And, and, and actually, um, you know, for what it's worth... Would I have got any recent previous Prime Minister and Chancellor to come on a network rail work site to advertise spending money on the railway? Not in a bloody million years. I'm really proud of that. That's why I went like a shot, you know? That's a good sign. It's not... It's, it's not it might, I don't think it's a false dawn. It's certainly not a full summer's day. But a, a, actually, we are going somewhere with this. And, and I think the, the end result might be better. Is it as good as what goes on in the continent? No, but then actually we have a habit in this country of wanting good public services but not paying for them through taxation. So let's be clear about that. You know, you've got to be really honest with yourself, haven't you, actually? And, 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 but, but all that having been said, 
moving the railway in the right direction to deliver something better is, is I think, the right thing to do. Right, ladies and gentlemen, we're on time for a... Uh, uh, sorry, we're on schedule for an on-time arrival, so I won't scupper that by doing too much by way of a wrap-up. Um, but three things I think I need to say. One is it really has been great to be meeting again. We wouldn't have had that sort of great. interaction as we had in the Q&As uh, if we weren't all sitting here uh, together uh, and not on Zoom. Uh, and even if we've all been kept well and truly apart by these rather bold um, markers that designate our own specific areas it has been it has been great to be together again um, thank you again very sincerely to each and every one of you because it is through your combined efforts uh, that the friends in support of the museum has come through the last 18 months in relatively good spirit uh, uh, with a fairly bold forward uh, plan for what we want to do now uh, in, in the future. So thank you most sincerely, as I say, each and every one of you for that and for your contributions. Uh, and above all else, thank you for, to Sir Peter. Um, I rather felt it was like the sort of dinner party host who says, well, I was thinking of giving you this and I was thinking of giving you that, but what I'm actually going to serve up is this. And I don't think anybody's been disappointed with what we were actually served up with. Uh, it's been fascinating, topical, You've seen how well it went down by, by the way the questions flowed afterwards. So a big round of applause, please, to Sir Peter.